Ladies and gentlemen, it is also a distinct honor for me to introduce our keynote speaker of the morning, the Honorable Rufus H. Yerksa, Deputy Director General of the World Trade Organization. Mr. Yerksa is currently uh, the Deputy Director of the World Trade Organization, initially born in the United States. He received his education from the University of Washington, the Seattle University School of Law, and Cambridge University. Mr. Yerksa has an extensive record as an international trade negotiator, diplomat, lawyer, and businessman in a wide variety of international corporations and organizations. He has worked in the Committee on Ways and Means of the U.S. House of Representatives, where he served as staff director of the Subcommittee on Trade, where he guided and drafted the enactments of several major pieces of trade legislation. Later, he served as presidential appointee to the Office of the United States Trade Representative during both Democratic and Republican administrations, first as Geneva-based ambassador to the GATT, and subsequently as the deputy USTR in Washington, the administration's highest ranking subcabinet post for trade negotiations. In these two positions, Mr. Yerksa played a major role in negotiating and securing congressional approval of both the Uruguay Round WTO agreements and the NAFTA Accord in 2002. Mr. Yerksa was appointed the deputy director uh, of the World Trade Organization in 2002. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a very, very sincere warm welcome for the Honorable Rufus H. Yerksa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Is that yes? That is on. Uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me, and uh, it was a pleasure to be here with my former boss and uh, good friend, uh, Dr. Subachai. Uh, very obviously, uh, somebody who's had a wide-ranging experience in the trade field, but also uh, a person who's become a very eloquent champion on issues uh, like sustainable development. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit, maybe not get too much into the weeds of, of WTO and of, of WTO issues, but talk a little more broadly um, about <clears throat> the subject I chose. Uh, you'll, you'll see from the title I said, Why Trade Rules Matter. <clears throat> a little broader than that, really, in the message I have today. Um, I guess I start by saying that, you know, Dr. Subachai brought me back to Geneva in 2002 where I became a, an international civil servant, and that is a transformation. It's an interesting one. It certainly has given me a, a lot of interesting experiences in, in the complexities of the global uh, uh, rulemaking environment and also of, of how to make uh, global governance uh, effective. Uh, certainly have led, to the, led me to the conclusion that we live in an extremely complicated world. That's no surprise to any of you. Uh, it's, not, it's not news I'm announcing, but uh, certainly one of the greatest complexities is really at the heart of this, this, this conference you've, you've, uh, you've had uh, scheduled here to talk about development and sustainability. And I, I thought a little bit about sort of those two uh, shall we say, goals, aspirations, and what they mean. Uh, and uh, once again, not anything new, but, but just to, to step back and analyze the two, the two a little bit and then talk, then return to the trade theme. I mean, to me, development, uh, is, is, development is a complex concept and a complex, ter complex term. It means both economic and uh, socio-political advancement uh, the term as it's used today in the, in the global policy debate implies that <clears throat> we can find a way uh, for a planet's huge and increasing population, most of which is poor, uh, to move up the economic ladder, uh, to enjoy decent living standards, uh, things, basic things that people in the developed world take for granted, like housing and food and clean water, reasonable health and education levels, uh, and that we can find a way to do this uh, in a fairly uh, socially uh, just and socially um, fair manner. Sustainability, to me, uh, you, you talk about the three pillars of sustainability to me, but if you put them all together, it really means um, can this, to me, can this higher level of of socioeconomic security be durable and can it be sustainable uh, into the future and into future generations? Obviously, very big environmental connotations and I think it very much depends on uh, the 
importance people put on the environmental goals versus the other aspects of sustainability. Certainly I see in the trade debate a much higher level of, of focus on environmental concerns. Um, but, you know, can the Earth's resources and environment sustain this higher level of economic activity? Uh, the higher exploitation of resources and strain on ecosystems. Uh, but I would suggest, obviously, the socioeconomic uh, implications also very strong. How can we ensure that the economic systems that are created by uh, a more uh, developing world economy uh, will be durable? We won't be looking at uh, economic bubbles that collapse and lead us back into uh, economic decline or chaos, uh, that we're not just a series of boom and bust that that are really unjust for, for the societies that have to endure them uh, and that create more social, political, and economic turmoil. And certainly if I look at the world's headlines today, uh, this debate has never been more relevant. Um, the developed world is the developed world. The really advanced high GDP countries are facing both an economic crisis, slow growth, deci declining levels of economic inequality, or put another way, increasing uh, inequality, huge debt and fiscal deficits, high unemployment, at least uh, historically from their perspective, although uh, many in the developing world would find some of those unemployment levels enviable, um, and a profound crisis of self-governance, uh, political deadlocks, lack of public confidence in governments, etc. That's really, if I look at the developed world today, that's, that's what I see. Uh, pretty much across the across the spectrum, the developing world is is more complex. First of all, much much bigger set of countries with much much different levels of developments. It's really, to me, it, it would be simplistic. But one simplistic way is is to say you can look at sort of two sets of of, of stories. Ones of of very encouraging success, uh, countries still enjoying high growth rates and even popular governments with popular policies although this is mixed, even in governments that are reasonably successful, there are some unpopular governments, but also a number of states in turmoil, political turmoil, uh, or even complete chaos, uh, and a uh, troubling list of what some would even call failed states in terms of um, their ability to, to self-govern. But even the ones that are doing well are struggling to deliver on the public's desire to see um, economic uh, development and its benefits spread broadly and deeply. So if we look even at the countries that we think of as the success stories of the last 20 years, take China, India, and Brazil, these are countries that still face huge challenges to bring very, very large numbers uh, of their population from poverty to economic security and to reasonable living standards. So even in those countries, you know, as, as my Indian colleague always says, within India you have a developed economy, and even an LDC economy. So it's important to understand that phenomenon. Um, now, this finally gets me to trade. I, I'm sure all of you were probably wondering when I was going to get there, uh, because talk about what role does trade play in all this, and why do I, does it lead me to the conclusion that, um, that sound trade rules are crucial to, to any uh, construct of, of um, sustainable development. At about 13 trillion per year, trade is a substantial driver of economic development and global prosperity. That's clear. In fact, trade is both a driver of growth and a symptom um, because wealth creation historically has always led to greater amounts of trade, which in turn creates increased economic efficiency and produces more wealth. Uh, and if one thing's pretty clear from the record, the nations that have seen the biggest increases in their living standards and in per capita GDP over the last several decades have all been more integrated into the global economy through greater trade. Uh, if we take the past 60 plus years as a barometer, the reality is really pretty clear. Trade is nearly 32 times greater today in volume terms than it was in 1950. And much, much, much faster growth in international trade than in domestic GDP over that period. Uh, and so it is, really isn't surprising to me that the clash between trade as a part of 
economic growth and sustainability issues has, has sharpened. Um, and in any debate over these clash of interests, uh, that is inevitable. I mean, if you think about, you know, human history, this, the search for food, fuel, housing, transportation, leisure, and other things has always necessitated exploitation of resources. Dr. Subichai talked about this example of what people need to do to have cooking fuel in, in Africa, um, and has always caused other environmental impacts. And uh, the push for higher economic growth and higher living standards often does lead societies to adopt pretty unsustainable policies from an environmental point of view. But I, I think probably the, if you're looking for the, what's the positive benefit out of all of that, it's, it's this, that we do see that as wealth increases both globally and in, 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 in separate uh, societies, so too does the concern for sustainability and concern for the environment, for example. Uh, the more economic prosperity a society enjoys, the greater the concern to address some of the problems. And if you look at the global debate today, it's clear that we are integrating these issues into the mainstream of, of the trade debate. How do we have more environmentally sustainable policies, even at the WTO? Um, and to me, that means you begin to focus on things, for example, well, if we're going to have a lot of need for greater energy resources in the future, how can they be more sustainable forms of energy, renewable energy, uh, green technologies? How can we adapt trade rules, for example, to make those technologies more um, <clears throat> cheaper and more uh, widely spread throughout the, 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 the globe? Uh, and that, to me, is, is a large element of, of what we need to do to find ways of making uh, trade and sustainability mutually supportive. But uh, back to my main point today, why then do trade rules matter? And, and this is the point I wanted to, uh, to get to. Uh, because it's, there's no doubt that this rapid expansion of trade that I talked about has led to a, a different type of world economy than we had in 1950. Uh, it's based on much deeper economic integration. Uh, the degree of dependency of countries on economic integration uh, and this has all kinds of consequences, some of them bad, but I would argue most of them good. Uh, the reality is that more and more our, our economies depend on this phenomenon of global supply chains, products that are not really produced in one country and sold to another in the classic sort of um, uh, Adam Smith concept of how comparative advantage works, but really produced from components designed uh, manufactured, and, and by the way, with the use of many, many services in, in lots of different countries, and may be assembled in yet another country. Uh, in other words, specialization, uh, higher degree of specialization, uh, or to put another way, more and more what nations are trading with each other is not goods per se, they're trading tasks. They're trading different specialized tasks in, in a global economy. Uh, now, the problem, of course, is twofold. One is this presents unique challenges because you have different economic systems all sharing in, in the production of, of individual products, and this leads to clashes between them about rules and about uh, whether or not things are fair and unfair in the trading system. There's also the problem that there are a number of countries that are left out of this equation and that suffer from not being able to get more fully integrated into this global supply chains. So the reasons why we've gotten to this state in kind of world trade and the global economy are exceedingly complex and many, I won't go into all of them, but one big reason, if you really think about it, was a conscious decision after World War II to avoid the mistakes of the 1920s and 1930s, um, to avoid a world based on mercantilism, protectionism, beggar thy neighbor trade policies, to move to a different system, lower trade barriers, more open investment. We build a system of rules, an imperfect system, but pretty profound really when you think about its broader implications over time. Uh, a system that governed how nations would treat one another in trade, such basic things as non-discrimination, limiting the use of trade distorting measures, lowering tariffs, 
the MFN principle, et cetera. These were all embedded in the original GATT, and most of them survive today in, in the WTO system. Of course, we also build a large number of other global institutions and rules, and some of which I would have to say play a, probably play a bigger role than the WTO, obviously. The, the IMF and World Bank, the whole UN its system itself, which has an exceedingly broad scope. It covers matters ranging from how do we get health care more widely dispersed throughout the, the, uh, the world to things like telecommunications, cooperation on telecommunications regulation to intellectual property. Um, so this is a system I would say we chose over the past 65 years. We, we consciously chose to have that kind of a system rather than something else. And then it evolved. And if you think about how much ex it's expanded, I just think about it in the WTO context. If you had thought in 1950 that the countries which were at the time the main proponents of a very, very different econ economic model, China and the Soviet Union, would be part of this system and would be basically integrated in a common set of rules with their former uh, ideological adversaries. That's one indication of how, how much that system has grown. And it, it did usher in a pretty remarkable period of global prosperity, but not surprisingly, along with that prosperity comes huge challenges like the environmental problems of, of global reach, the, the problems of inequality and maldistribution of wealth, the much more apparent gaps between the haves and the have-nots that, that now are a lot more obvious in a, in a, in a globalized system. Uh, problems of opening your markets to competition with countries which might have, for example, lower wage rates or different or policies with respect to currencies that you think are manipulative or um, higher levels of government intervention in the economy. So entering into competition with countries that have very different systems. So my main argument to you is all of that to me is not a symptom that the system we build over 65 years is a failure. It's, these, are, these are symptoms, classic symptoms of success. Success brings with it other problems. And they have to be dealt with, uh, but to me, they don't raise a fundamental question about whether the global system is on the right track or on the wrong track. Uh, and I would say that um, this is an important issue to focus on now in the current international environment, because there are a lot of people who think that maybe we should, uh, we should scrap a lot of what's there in the system, that we should maybe some who, unfortunately, I think maybe think we should go back to a world based more on this concept of producing and consuming locally, protecting our own national economies, rebuilding your national economic strength, and using that to compete uh, more effectively. I mean, first, the question of whether that's really a realistic model to move back to. There are some countries that are trying it. Uh, but. I guess I would say I have news for those who think that, that sort of building on that model globally would be a great idea, and that, that, that news is simple. You know, the old world order of pre-World War II was pretty much built on that model, and it was a spectacular failure. Um, it was a world of economic imperialism, uh, world wars, a disastrous mix of bad economic ideologies and dictatorship, and I'd say it's much better to have the problems of today than it would be to have those problems. Um, at least the problems of today, where we have global problems, we have some sense in the global community that we have to share in working on the solutions. Yes, of course, very, very difficult. And certainly I'm seeing this in the WTO, how difficult it is to get countries to agree with each other in, in the global system. But I say that because I don't think that's a sign of failure. I think it's a sign of the increasing challenges of dealing with your successes. And in an institution like the WTO, we are facing a crisis of confidence. Um, just like we are, I would say, in the national governments, as I talked about earlier. And to me, this has created a kind of an unwillingness to move forward. Uh, take the Doha round as an example. Uh, even though there is probably a recognition that moving backward is not the right idea. Uh, in short, we have paralysis. And paralysis creates fear. 
and uh, that's what I really see today on the face of, of, of people in international negotiations is a certain fear about the future. Uh, and I guess my reaction to that is to sort of maybe we should think about Franklin Roosevelt's advice that we really have nothing to fear but fear itself uh, and we ought to figure out ways of moving forward. And moving forward may mean looking at new paradigms. I'm not suggesting that because I think that there's a lot of success in what we have that it has to stay exactly the way it is. In fact, if you look at efforts like a climate change agreement or the Doha round, it is an effort to move to somewhat different paradigm to, for example, uh, uh, improve the, uh, the fairness of the system across the board to deal with um, countries that have been left out of the system more effectively. And a challenge probably to, to some of the richest countries are, are they willing, for example, in an area like climate change, are they willing to, to face the need for, um, for controlling um, some of the consequences of their wealth? Uh, and so I would say uh, the first thing that, that the major governments of the world ought to do now is, is first of all, recommit themselves to the institutions, to the procedures uh, that uh, have worked pretty well for 65 years. Uh, the system their predecessors were pretty wise in building. Uh, I think there has to be a re recommitment to that. Um, and I would certainly put the WTO in that category. And then get back to work on figuring out how can we take it forward. If there are new paradigms to explore, let's have some intelligent debate about what they are. And uh, the Doha round, for us is, is part of that equation, but only one part. Uh, I, I think that uh, we, we have to see a much, much better effort on the part of the leaders of the G20 uh, to, to begin to understand the need for a common sense of direction. Uh, I hope this isn't too general. Uh, to, you know, I wanted to stay somewhat at a, at a higher altitude rather than getting into debates about specific issues. But obviously, if there are things people want to talk about, about specific elements of the trade agenda, I'm, I'm more than willing to do that. And once again, thank you very much for inviting me, and I wish you luck with the rest of the conference. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Yerksa. Would you have a few moments for some questions, or how are we doing? Uh, One or two? Yeah, maybe. Unfortunately, I'm supposed to go to a meeting at 11, but I'll, I'll take another five yeah? or ten minutes. Yeah. That would be great. So I'd say let's group together maybe a few questions. I'd ask you if you could please just maybe hold up your hand if you have a question. Briefly introduce yourself. Just tell us where you're coming from and try to keep your questions. We have a 30-second rule at uh, ICD just to allow as many voices to be heard as possible. And then one question each. Uh, so let's start in the back, please. Yes, hello. I'm Jana Berry. Um, about the paralysis, um, how are we going to solve it? How are you going to solve it? Thank you. And then maybe let's take one or two others, if there are. Yes, please. Hello, I'm Hannah. I'm from the Netherlands slash UK. Um, I would like to know what you feel about the BRICS, the developing economies, and how that could come into sustainable development and cultural diplomacy. Excellent. So you're keeping it very, very efficient. I saw a hand in the middle. Yes, no. Was there another question or comments? No? Going once, going twice. Okay, it's back back to you, Mr. Exa, please. Well, they're both good because they're big big questions <laughs> and not easy answers. And certainly, uh, to me, the, the, the key question really is about this paralysis and, and what do we do about it? Because I, I think it's driven largely by domestic uh, uh, considerations, domestic problems. I don't really think it's driven by um, by, you know, obviously there is a conflict between countries about what to do with rules. It's true in the WTO. It's true in many other uh, UN bodies where they're trying to negotiate something further. Climate change is just one example. But um, that's not really where the problem lies. The problem doesn't lie at the negotiating table. And gee, if these countries could only agree. The problem, I think, really lies back home in many of these countries with their own domestic uh, politics. Um, and certainly, in, as I said earlier, in developed countries, it's because there is uh, paralysis over uh, how to solve uh, the big fiscal and debt 
problems they face. Um, they keep talking about economic growth, but you know how can you get economic growth if you if you can't overcome these kinds of problems? And what is what is the correct mix of, shall we say, um, reforms? I mean, take take my own country, the U.S. What is the correct mix of reforms and entitlements versus uh, what to do with revenue and taxes? Uh, what to do with those basic elements before you can move on to um, an international economic agenda, for example. Um, and so the paralysis there kind of leads to uh, charges that, uh, you know, the reason for the economic malaise, high unemployment and other things, is trade or China, put another way, in the U.S. debate rather than getting your own economic house in order and, and being able then to, to compete more effectively. I think that's true in, in Europe as well. Maybe uh, the debate is somewhat more confused in Europe because Europe is a, you know, is a union of many, many different states and many political systems. And so, you know, obviously the, the Greek crisis, the Spanish crisis, it's focused more on what to do about that. But at the heart of it is still the same issues, the issues of debt and of, um, you know, the right mix of policies on both the, the revenue side and on reform of, of, of various programs in order to allow um, sound fiscal policies that will stimulate greater growth. And of course, this very lively debate about if you do too much of one, will it stifle growth and will you have a prolonged period, will too much austerity lead to a prolonged period of, of malaise, which certainly from my point of view, you know, if we see this, this prolonged period of malaise going for a long time, it, it has big implications for what countries are willing to do in, in trade, for example. What are, the, what are the developed countries willing to do to, for example, open agriculture trade more to the, to the developing world? And that gets to my, the question you've asked, because if you look at the BRICS, of course, it's, let's remember, it's a big mix of countries with very, very different economies and very different uh, interests. So if you look at the interests of China versus Brazil or Russia, they are very different. Their, their mix of, of, um, of economic activity is very different. For a country like Brazil, what I just said is, is very important to, to them from a long-term policy perspective. Because they are an agricultural powerhouse, uh, unless they see greater uh, integration of agriculture into the WTO system, for example, they're not willing to go further in areas like industry and services. Um, for a country like Russia, it's probably very different. Uh, Russia is just becoming a member of the WTO. Uh, Russia has been outside of the WTO system. Uh, well, I mean, the Soviet Union was outside of the GATT system, so Russia inherited that, and it took a very long time for them to negotiate their accession. And there was a huge debate inside Russia about, is it really in our interest to join? Because there were certain people who said, well, you know, let's put it this way, the successful elements of the Russian economy, which was very much based on resources and energy products, were saying, you know, everything we export is... Uh, without bearers. We don't have any trouble exporting oil and exporting gas and exporting energy products because the consuming nations need that. Uh, but if we join WTO, we'll be facing much more import competition in areas like agriculture and some of our old industries and even in services. And is that really in our interest? The reformers inside Russia said this is exactly what we need to do because this is a way of getting our economy more diversified and more modernized and more able to be if you want to use this term sustainable in, in, the, in the long term. So um, I think it's hard. It, it, I don't see in the final analysis, I don't see the BRICS as being a, a kind of a unified block with one single model or agenda for how to, to define the, the, the international system. 
any more than I see the developed countries as a unified bloc, any more than I see, um, you know, the developing world per se as a unified bloc. Everybody has their own interests, and, and that's what's become very clear to me. I think it's been clear in, in other fora like, like in the UN, but it's certainly very clear in the, in, the, in the WTO that what you see is more and more countries asserting their own uh, national uh, perspectives rather than uh, seeing themselves as part of some, some bloc. But the question then becomes, how do we get uh, unity around where to go with, with rules? I mean, it's important to emphasize that the system of rules we have today is still pretty broadly shared by the members of the WTO as being a, a good system. Nobody's proposing walking away from it. In fact, if anything, we've got more and more people joining it. The question becomes, how do we deepen some of its disciplines? How do we deal with issues like agriculture unless we can get consensus? Um, and that's where I think responsibility really comes into the equation. The BRICS will have increased responsibility for leadership in this system, just given their growth rates, given their economic importance, given the transition from the world I negotiated in back as a U.S. negotiator in the late 80s was very much a world, uh, the, the trade world was dominated by the, the U.S. and the Europeans. It's very, very different now, and, and I would say ultimately that's better because um, what, what we need now are things that, that really reflect a more broadly shared consensus of how to go forward. I think the BRICS can play a crucial role in that. Um, but it will take time. China is a relatively new member of the system. Russia hasn't even really formally entered yet. Um, Brazil and India, of course, have been there a long time. Uh, and I would say that they, they still play a very, you know, a very significant role in, in shaping the direction. I don't see us able to do agreements that, that, uh, that they don't support. And more and more, it's not just about the BRICS, it's about the rest of the developing world, which, which has become much, much more um, involved in and active in, in wanting to see uh, how the, the rules are shaped and wanting to see how it will be a more balanced system. Uh, that doesn't make me, uh, some people say, oh, gee, there's so many countries now involved, how will we ever get agreements on things? You know, we got agreement in the Uruguay round with 125 countries. We now have 156, uh, but some big new players. But I don't, I'm not at all despondent about the ability to get them to work together once the big players start seeing a better sense of direction. That gets me back to your issue about paralysis. Once the big players aren't paralyzed, I see the rest of the world as pretty much willing and able to, to, to move the system forward. All right, well, thank you very, very much, Mr. Eriks. I think that was really uh, inspiring as well as an insightful uh, chance for us to think about the challenges as well as the opportunities for the World Trade Organization and beyond. Uh, I think we've exceeded your, your generous uh, time lot. I mean, I think you thank do need to unfortunately uh, leave to the next meeting. But, meeting, so. but if we could please express our gratitude a second time to Mr. Eriks for a wonderful <laughs> keynote address. Thank you very much.